your, our Bibles, I hope, are open at Judges chapter 6. Will you just turn back to the beginning of that chapter, please? Um, we'd like to, in our first address, deal with as much as we can of chapter 6. In our second address, deal with as much as we can of chapter 7. We'll, we'll struggle to get through it all, but uh, we're going to go at a good pace. So you've got to get your, uh, your, your Bible at the ready, your fingers at the ready to turn the pages. And uh, we're going to really try to tease out what it is that uh, this character, Gideon, teaches about the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will return. So let's set some context. You see in verse one that the time uh, in Israel's history is that the Midianites have oppressed them now for seven years. Uh, it's been so challenging that they've had to, the children of Israel in verse 2 have had to get into the dens, into the mountains, into caves and strongholds. They've had to hide themselves from the oppressor. And, and we're told in verse 3, I want you to note this please, that when Israel had sown, that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites, and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza. And they left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. Now, I want you to remember that, that there is, there's nothing left. For they come up with their cattle and their tents, and they came up as grasshoppers. It's, it's the word locusts uh, used elsewhere in Scripture. You think of the plague of the locusts that came into Egypt. This is the same word. So the locusts, they're, they're described as being like they were, and their camels without number. And they entered into the land to destroy it. So the, the Midianites have come and the picture is bleak for the nation of Israel. For seven years, they have been uh, had to deal with this nation that's just brought themselves in. They, they've marauded in and they have taken over the land. Uh, and we see in verse six that Israel was greatly impoverished now that word impoverished i put a little note in my margin isaiah 17 and verse 4 and in isaiah 17 we won't turn there because of time but in isaiah 17 you, you'll remember the chapter it's the chapter where we see damascus brought to a ruin because uh, a northern invader comes sweeping down and then we see that following that the invader comes through damascus and it's talking in Isaiah's day of the Assyrian. Of course, it's also prophetic of the last days when the latter day Assyrian will come through Syria, through Damascus, which uh, is a ruinous heap. And he'll come down into the land of Israel. And, and we read that Jacob will, Jacob will be made thin. So that word impoverished is picked up in Isaiah 17, made thin. It, and it points forward to the state of the nation when the Gogian Confederacy will drop down into the land of Israel. Now, before Gideon comes along, you, you notice something that um, we, we don't necessarily reflect on very often. Certainly in the readings in our house, if we're reading Judges, we, we sort of seem to focus on the character of Gideon. And really, it was only recently when I read it a little bit more carefully that I found myself noticing a character before Gideon comes on the scene in this story. So, so just go to verse 7 where we read, it came to pass when the children of Israel cried to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet. Now, you see that this prophet, all we know about him is from verse 7 down to verse 10. He's, he's nameless. We, we know nothing of this prophet. This prophet comes and says, thus said the Lord God of Israel, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you forth out of the hand of Egypt. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of all that oppress you. I drained them out before you and gave their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you've not obeyed my voice. Verse 11, we come to Gideon. So we ask ourselves the question, what's this about then, that, that this unnamed prophet is sent before and he tells them they've not obeyed God's voice well we're going to suggest that if Gideon and we'll see shortly that he is is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ that this unnamed prophet who goes before Gideon it's reasonable for us in the type to suggest that this is a type of John the Baptist or, of course, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, this is a type of Elijah. 
So, so John the Baptist and Elijah, we see um, that their roles are, are much the same. Um, certainly in Elijah's second coming, when he's sent to turn the hearts of the fathers to the, uh, to the, to the, of the children to the fathers, um, for them to uh, be prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so just with th- this idea of John in our mind, let's just turn to the New Testament and we'll keep a marker here. But when you come to Luke chapter one, where we read at the end of the chapter of a prophecy that Zacharias, John's father, speaks concerning his to be born son, John. So Luke chapter one, and we read in verse 76, and thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest. So so at this stage, there's no name. You'll be called the prophet of the most high, the highest. And thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. So this is the unnamed prophet that we see in Judges chapter six. And his job will be to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. So the the job of John the Baptist is going to be to give knowledge of salvation and, and to let people know how they can have remission of their sins. Okay, keep that in mind. And let's keep building this little picture of this John the Baptist character. Or, or, or the unnamed prophet in Gideon's story, and come with me to John now, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Now, in the Gospel of John, you see that when John is challenged by the leaders of the people, who are you? So John chapter 1, verse 19, he doesn't say, as we might expect him to say, I am John, the son of Zacharias. They call me John the Baptist. No, no, he doesn't say that. John 1 verse 19. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He confessed and denied not, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And and they asked him, who who are you? He said, I'm not. Are you Elijah? I'm not. Are, Are you that prophet? He said, no. Who are you? They say. And what's his answer? Verse 23. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. So his answer isn't his name. His answer is that he is the voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Now we'll go there shortly to Isaiah chapter 40, which is where he's quoting from, isn't he? So he says, I am the voice as said Isaiah. Before you turn to Isaiah, I want you to notice something else. That when John speaks, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes onto the scene, we see he introduces the Lord Jesus in a very specific manner. Verse 29, when John saw Jesus coming to him, he said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Now, what's the what was the mission of John the Baptist? Remember, we read in Luke chapter one. I'll read it to you again in verse 77 to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. So when the Lord Jesus comes along, his job is to tell people that's the man who's going to provide salvation for the remission of our sins. And so he introduces him as the Lamb of God, which is going to take away the sin of the world. That's the man, says John, that's going to deal with the problem of sin. Now, we saw, didn't we, in verse 23 of John chapter 1, that John has said, make straight the way of the Lord, as said Isaiah the prophet. So let's go to Isaiah. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 40, please. So we're reflecting on the fact that this character, he speaks of John the Baptist and John's work in preparing the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the one that's going to deal with the problem of sin. But but of course, we're also considering in our reflections this afternoon that 
what um, we're looking at in Gideon is someone who's going to teach us something about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in his second coming. Now, now, now that much of those reflections will come out of our second address more. In this first one, we're setting the context um, of our story in chapter six. But, but needless to say, in I- here we are now in Isaiah chapter 40. And we see in verse three, this is what John was quoting, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And the the, the question is asked, verse six, the voice said, what shall I cry? So so this voice who's preparing the way of the Lord asked the question, what, what, what shall I say? You know, what, what, what's the key thing? You know, what's the summary of what it is that I need to say is the voice preparing the way of the Lord. And the answer is this. All flesh is grass. All the goodliness thereof is the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God shall stand forever. So, brothers and sisters, the character that goes before Gideon, the character that goes before the Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, the one who will go before the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming, Elijah, the cry is to tell the world all flesh is grass. That's of real significance, because actually that's our call today. If we're to prepare the way of the Lord, if we're to prepare our friends and neighbours around us of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the message that as Christadelphians we should still be shouting is all flesh is grass. The only thing that can stand is the word of God, which will stand forever. Now, we're going to see that in the Gideon story. The Gideon story is going to teach us that all flesh is grass. Only God's word will stand. So come with me now back to our story. uh, And... uh, Come back to Judges chapter six. And when you turn there, well, we're being reminded of that because what we're seeing is that the children of Israel, they've been impoverished now for seven years. And in fact, they're so impoverished, they've been eaten up by the locusts or by the grasshoppers. What the grasshoppers, the locusts have done is they've shown All flesh is grass. Israel don't stand a chance. They might have thought in their might that they were going to be fine, that everything was going to be no problem for them. That's not the case. What they're learning is that all flesh is grass. And the nation are having to be humbled for them to accept the deliverer in Gideon. Much like what is going to happen at the time of the end. I wonder, too, that the time period here of seven years is even a reflection of the time of Jacob's trouble just before the Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself at the Battle of Armageddon. We believe that there's a significant time period, and that seven years, I think, fits into the time period of how difficult it's going to be for the nation of Israel when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Okay, so... Here in Judges chapter 6, verse 11, there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abbey Ezrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So I want you to notice that, that, that Gideon is an Abbey Ezrite. Uh, we'll, we'll come to the meaning of that word shortly, but it's important in our story. And here he is threshing wheat. And and there's something of importance here because the first time we come across Gideon, he's threshing wheat in the wine press. And both of those things are 
key bits of language for the time of the end. The, the, the threshing of the wheat, just remind yourself what Armageddon means. Armageddon means a heap of sheaves in a valley of threshing. So this is Armageddon language that we're being introduced to when we meet with Gideon. Now, this character, clearly he's only a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's going to have to go on a major developmental journey in order to show us something of the character of the Lord Jesus. We also notice he's in the wine press. And, and that's of significance because we understand that after the threshing of Armageddon, the wine press has to be trodden, and that's in, recorded for us in Revelation chapter 14, where when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, there are two major battles. There's the, the, the sheaves, that the, 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 the sickle having to go in because the harvest is ripe. That's Armageddon. But there's also the treading of the wine press, and that is the treading down of the Roman Catholic system. So in just that one verse, we're shown something that points forward to the time of the end in the character of Gideon. Now, uh, we'll come back to uh, some of these verses in our second address. Gideon, though, we understand from verse 14, sees himself as the least of uh, his father's house. Verse 14, the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? He said to him, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is the poorest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my father's house. He doesn't believe he's got the credentials. What's Gideon got to learn? All flesh is grass. Because you're the least in your father's house, I'm going to be able to make use of you, says God. And so Gideon asked for a sign. And he says in verse 17, if now I found grace in thy sight, show me a sign that you are talking with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present. So just look in the margin at the word present. Uh, you, you, you'll see that it's simply the word meal offering. So he, he's going to bring a meal offering to God. And he said, I'll tarry until you come again. So Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out to him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of the Lord said to him, take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. He did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand. He touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And so Gideon is shown, if he is prepared, despite being the least of his father's house, or the poorest in Manasseh, if he is prepared to give everything to God. Do, do you see that language in verse 20? Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, put them on this rock and pour them out. Brothers and sisters, that's the exhortation for us. It doesn't matter what our background. We're all the least in our father's houses. We're, you know, we're, we're the poorest of Manasseh. We're, we're no different. But if we're prepared to bring our offering, where does the offering have to go? On this rock. Now, the rock speaks to us in Scripture, doesn't it, of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're prepared to bring our offering and pour it on to the Lord Jesus Christ and give it all, it's emptied out, it's all given, then it will be accepted. And Gideon, will become a mighty one, as we too will become mighty ones. And so, brothers and sisters, that's the first lesson Gideon is given in the sign that he asked for. If we are prepared to pour out everything we've got in service to our Heavenly Father, we pour it where? Not just anywhere. We don't just go and say, well, I tell you what, I'll, um, 
uh, you know, I'm going to go and sign up for this charity over here, and I and I'm going to go and you know go and volunteer in in, in the school, and be part of the PTA, and no, 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 that's not what you're asked to do. What Scripture asks you to do is to pour it out on the rock. And so our service to our Heavenly Father isn't about the things that we might choose to do, being good people, as it were. It's about our service in the Lord, in the truth. It's on the rock and nothing else. But if we do pour it out like that, then we will be given the same assurance that Gideon is given. So then we see, came to pass, verse 25, the same night, busy night for Gideon, that the Lord said to him, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grave, the grove rather, that's by it. Now, I want you to look in your margin next to the phrase, even the second bullock. You just see that the, 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 there's a different suggestion for us in the margin. And both the authorised version and the revised version tell us that the word even perhaps is the word and. Now, I think that this is important um, in what we're learning now in our story so so if i may let me just read verse 25 again i've put it there for you on the screen take thy father's young bullock and the second bullock of seven years old now what is he to do well this is slightly odd in that he you know he's asked to take the young bullock but then he then sacrifices the second bullock and the second bullock, we're told, is of seven years old. So what is it that's going on here? Well, we understand that this is teaching us of principles far greater than simply the pulling down of the altars of Baal. We'd suggest practically that the first bullock is used to, to, to drag away the altar, to cut down the grove by it. And, uh, you know, a, a great ox like this. We can see on the screen could could get a rope put around the altar and and drag it away, but Gideon is then told to build an altar. This is obviously the true altar that God wants, and take the second bullock, verse twenty six, and offer a burnt offering. So, what are we to learn from this? Well, the first, and then the second. And the second bullock is the one that's used as the sacrifice. And that bullock is a particular age. It's seven years old. We would suggest that it's just enough. It's perfectly enough. It's seven years old. It's complete to deal with the problem of sin. And the problem of sin is shown us in verse one of chapter six. The Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. So the second bullock of seven years old is the perfect offering to deal with the problem of the Midianites who impoverished the land. They're, they're, they're the metaphor here in our story for sin. So the first bullock, we would suggest the young bullock, that speaks to us of the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law, it had to take away the problem of the altars. It, 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 it tried to show the way to the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's the second bullock. It's the Lord Jesus who provides the solution. A, a useful reference that I put in my margin, I'll, I'll read to you from Hebrews chapter 8. Just to read you one verse from Hebrews 8 and a couple of verses from Hebrews 10, just to make this point. So Hebrews 8 verse 7, if for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no place sought for the second. All right, so you see that this principle of two, of the two covenants. Let me give you another verse in Hebrews 10. 
Verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So that bullock of seven years old is, as it were, it's once for all dealing with the Midianite oppression of seven years. On the day that that bullock was born, uh, not necessarily the day, the year that that bullock was born, it was the year that the Midianites had come into the land. Do you see? And so the Lord Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from when? From the foundation of the world. Because he was always going to be the one to be the solution to sin. And so although the young bullock, the, 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 the first bullock is a young bullock, that's the law of Moses. That, that came in after this young bullock is perhaps two or three years old, uh, as they would use under the law. Okay, I'm going to keep us moving, um, if I may. Verse 33, Gideon's up all night. He deals with the altars of Baal. And then we read verse 33, that all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the East were gathered together. Now, that's Armageddon language. You, you remember in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16, that's a note to put next to gathered together. When the kings of the earth are gathered together, the frog-like spirits go out to draw the nations to the battle of Armageddon. We're told in Revelation 16, 16, he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So all the Midianites, the Amalekites, the children of the East were gathered together and they went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Now, the Valley of Jezreel is a, an important uh, valley in Scripture, and, and th there's much that we could draw out of this valley. But I want you to note one point. I asked you to remember in verse 3 of chapter 6 that it was all going wrong for Israel when Israel had sown. So Judges 6 and verse 3. When Israel had sown, well, they're in a pickle. What does Jezreel mean? Jezreel means God sows. So at the Battle of Armageddon, this will be now God dealing with the problem. When Israel sows, it's not going to work because all flesh is grass. The solution is going to need to come in the place where God sows. So we're told, verse 34, that the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and Abiezer was gathered after him. Now, do you remember from verse 11 that Gideon is the son of Joash, the Abi Ezrite? So Gideon's family come with him. Abiezer was gathered after him. This speaks of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we come with the Lord Jesus Christ, we are his family. And Abiezer means, you think of, you know, we break it down. Ab, we know, don't we? Abba is father. And Ezer, well, that sounds perhaps a bit like Ezra, doesn't it? And Ezra, you remember, means help. So Abi Eza means my father helped. This is key. It's God who's sowing now. The spirit of Yahweh, verse 34, is on Gideon. And so he blew a trumpet and the father helped. It clearly, literally, the family come to him, but spiritually, the father is helping. Now, we're then going to see in chapter 7, how the father helps, how this battle unfolds that, that, that's set before us. We see the trumpet blowing, don't we, of the call to the battle. But Gideon, he 
just needs one more sign. He needs one more sign. And brothers and sisters, what's remarkable here is that ultimately this is how the father has helped. Verse 36, Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you've said, behold, I, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and if we dry upon all the earth beside, then I'll know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you've said. We ask the question, where's he getting this fleece from? Do you remember what it said at the end of verse four? Just, just remind yourself, flick back to verse four. The Midianites were so oppressive to Israel that they left no sustenance halfway through verse four for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. So where's he got the fleece from? The father helped. We're reminded, aren't we? We won't go there of passages like Isaiah 59. When God saw that there was no man, his arm brought salvation. And so now the father is going to help. And in order for a fleece to be found, I'm going to suggest to you that a sacrifice has been made. And so our answer to the question, where has the fleece come from? It's come from the Father. But we need to now unpick what it is that this fleece is speaking to us about. We're suggesting that a sacrifice has been made. And so our minds, no doubt, are racing as we reflect that this, no doubt, is speaking about something far greater than simply a Sunday school story of God's uh, goodness to Gideon in giving him this sign. This sign is simply remarkable. I'll put a fleece of wool on the floor. What did the prophet call? What did John the Baptist say? His job was to tell the people about how their sins could be forgiven. He introduces the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God. I suggest a sacrifice has been made of a lamb. And so now we've got a fleece. And this fleece, we're told, particularly is of wool. And we might make a couple of notes in our margin next to the words wool. We don't obviously come across wool so often in scripture, but it's symbolic. And just keep your marker, uh, or keep a marker here in Judges 6. But I want you to turn to a couple of references. First, Isaiah chapter 1. You'll know this uh, passage well, where the Lord Jesus, where the Lord God, in speaking through Isaiah to the nation, says, verse 18, Come now, let's reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So the wool speaks of the forgiveness of sins, of sins forgiven. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They shall be as wool, like on a fleece. Let me give you another reference, please. And that's in the book of Revelation. I want you to come to Revelation 1. We're going to go here in our second address too. But here in Revelation 1, we read of the multitudinous Christ. This is a picture of the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints when he comes. And we see in verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And so bringing that back here to Judges chapter 6, I'll put a fleece of wool on the floor. The wool speaks to us of the forgiveness of our sins, of sin forgiven. And he, the sign is 
that he wants it, doesn't he, to be dry on the ground. There's no dew at all on the earth when he gets up in the morning, but the fleece will have wool on it. Now, you know that the second sign he asked for is that the fleece will be dry, but the ground will have dew on it. Now, what is this speaking of? Well, the dew in scripture is a symbol of God's word. All flesh is grass. Where does the dew go? The dew goes on the grass. All flesh is grass, but the word of God will stand forever. So let me give you a couple of references. First of all, when you come to Deuteronomy, I haven't put that on the screen, but first come to Deuteronomy to see... Deuteronomy 32, in the Song of Moses, we read, verse 2, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, and the small rain upon the tender grass, as the showers upon the grass. Behold, I will publish the name of Yahweh, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock that Gideon poured his offering upon. God's speech is as the dew. The word of God, Isaiah 40, will stand forever. All flesh is grass. Now, when is it that we will be changed? It's at the resurrection, isn't it? When this vile body will be destroyed. All flesh is grass. It's got to go. We'll need to be changed. And will be changed to be made like him. What's he like? He is the word of God. So come with me to Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26. Let's see what it says of when we're to be changed. Verse 19, Isaiah 26. Thy dead men shall live. Well, this is talking the resurrection, isn't it? Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. Shall they arise? Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs. And the earth, the word earth there is the same word ground that we've got in Judges chapter six. And the ground or the earth shall cast out the dead. Come with me to First Corinthians chapter 15. Because now the sign of the fleece is suddenly made absolutely clear to us. The fleece is a picture of the sacrifice, Lord Jesus Christ. The fleece is laid out. And first, the dew is only on the fleece. First Corinthians 15, verse 23. Talking of the resurrection, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. The Jew is first only on the fleece. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. And so the second sign is the Jew on the fleece. No, it doesn't need to be. The Lord Jesus Christ was the first fruits. The second time, the dew is on the ground, on the earth, because this now speaks of the resurrection of the saints. And so come with me back to Judges. To Judges chapter six. To see the clarity of this sign. We're told, aren't we, in verse 38, it was so. He rose up early on the morrow. That's resurrection language. That's Mark 16. He rose up early on the morrow and thrust the feast together and wring the dew out of the feast, a bowl full of water. And then, of course, he's given the second sign, which speaks of the resurrection of the saints. I want you to notice something else. When I... I um, I found that point a, a little while ago. I felt so excited. 
And I thought, well, I've got to look at each word here and you know, really try to work out what's happening in the rest of the in the in the rest of the words in these verses. And I found it interesting to see the language in verse 38, where we read that he thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. He wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Now, I want you to stick with me. In Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 9, You've got the same word here, ringed, but used of the sin offering. Where we're told in Leviticus chapter 5 that they'll sprinkle of the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be wrung out of the offering. So we think of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as he was literally wrung out. He emptied himself. In Philippians chapter 2, when you turn there, just keep a marker here, but come with me to Philippians chapter 2. We shall go here as well in our second address. God willing. Philippians chapter 2, where we read of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who, despite being the Son of God, like Gideon, was made of the least, as it were, in his father's house. This is the one born in a stable, no less, who, we're told in verse 6, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Now, the, the English Standard Version there says he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So in that form of a servant, he totally emptied himself. You think of the fleece being wrung out, being emptied. Now, when was it that the Lord Jesus Christ absolutely emptied himself? When we saw the, that the water being wrung out, the blood of the sin offering being wrung out. Well, you, you might give me a, a couple of references here. I, I've put for you John 19 on the screen. You, you, you might first go to Luke 22. Come with me to Luke 22, where we see the Lord Jesus Christ wringing himself out, as it were, pouring himself out giving everything to the Father. And we see in verse 42, he says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from thee, from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel to him from heaven, strengthening him. This is what happened to Gideon. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. You think of the sin offering, the blood was wrung out. You think of the fleece, the water was wrung out. Great drops of sweat, like blood, are just dripping down the water and the blood. Will you come to John chapter 19? And you think to have a fleece, the offering was going to need to have been skinned. And the burnt offering in Leviticus chapter 1, the authorised version describes it being flayed, doesn't it? That, that's the word skinned. So the burnt offering was flayed. The Lord Jesus Christ is the sin offering. He's the burnt offering. He completely gives himself. And at the point where, as it were, he's flayed, he's completely given. This is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What do we see happen? Verse 34 of John 19. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And so the ringing out of the offering, 
the wringing out of the fleece is shown us in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We might ask ourselves, if we bring our thoughts together to close our first class, why would that be so important? Well, if you're Gideon and his men, his family who've been gathered to him, what is it that you would want to know before going into battle? You'd want to know, wouldn't you, about the resurrection of the dead? We wonder that these men of faith, it's taken me over 40 years to work out what that sign is about, but wonder that these men of faith could see something that perhaps we just read over. And they were able to go into battle in the assurance of knowing that all flesh is grass, the word of God was going to last, and they could hope in the resurrection of the dead. And so in our second address, we'll look more carefully now at the battle, which is going to need to be won between Gideon and the Midianites and what it teaches us about the time of the end.